traveling can be a life-giving or a long-lasting nightmare. Knowing what to research before you book your trip could have a significant impact on your experience and help you to be incredibly safe. Today's guest is Asher Ferguson. Asher has been traveling around the world since 2004 when he left Australia to study in the U.S., where he received his undergrad and master's degrees. He has lived all over the globe, including India, Europe, Hawaii, and the mainland U.S., He enjoys researching the travel industry and has been featured on CNN, USA Today, The New York Times, National Geographic, and many other publications. I'm your host, Chris Parker, and this is the Easy Prey Podcast. Asher, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Prey Podcast today. Thanks for having me. So can you give myself and the audience a little bit of background about who you are and how you got involved in talking about travel? Yeah, so I grew up in Australia, Sydney, Australia, and when I was 18, I got a scholarship to come to America to study at university, where I did my undergraduate and studied business and um, journalism and marketing. Um, And then when I graduated in 2008, I got the opportunity to volunteer at a nonprofit in the Netherlands. And then from there, I got the opportunity to travel to India. And that started me down this rabbit hole of um, traveling the world. And so I've been all over Europe. Um, I I spent almost two years living in India. And um, I started learning all the do's and don'ts through my own trial and error and my own horrible experiences while traveling both as a solo traveler, but also with groups and with friends, everything in between. And now as a parent, also as a family traveler. And um, in that process, I started a travel website, which is my name, asherferguson.com, and started sharing all my tips of how to stay safe, particularly with India is where I started. But now we talk about the whole world and we do a lot of research and get a lot of media coverage on all these really important topics about travel safety. And um, that's how we got here today. Awesome. How how many countries have you visited? Um, I haven't counted recently, but I would guess it's in the range between 30 and 40. Um, I definitely prefer to spend longer time in one country than trying to bucket list a week here or there. So, um, yeah, I would say it's over 30. That's awesome. I I haven't counted, but I'm probably 15, maybe 20, but I think it's been more of the, uh, in one week, we went through five or six countries, sometimes multiple countries in one day. And the airport doesn't count. (laughs) Correct. Airports don't count. (laughs) <laughs> so so let's 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 talk about some of the things that you have learned I I guess let me kind of break it down are there differences between uh, issues and kind of I ha- I hate to say, phrase it this way but kind of first world countries versus third world countries different types of issues to be careful about Definitely like when you're going to places like India or Mexico or anywhere where the hygiene levels may not be up to your body's sort of Western standards, then you're going to run into a lot of um, issues regarding cleanliness of food and water. And obviously, they're the fundamentals to life. If they're not clean and your body's not used to that, there's going to be problems. And the most common problems are, you know, dysentery or food poisoning of various kinds. And all of those are avoidable if you know what to expect and how to take the precautions necessary to avoid dysentery. So so what are the precautions? Like I've never (laughs) – I I guess for the most part, I have not traveled in countries long enough where I've had to worry about this. So what what are the things that you should expect and what should you be doing in preparation? Yeah. So the obvious most simple rule of thumb with food – is that only eat piping hot cooked food or something that you can peel and you're certain that it's clean. Mm -hmm. So, you know, any salads, juices, anything like that, no go. Any fruits that are pre-cut, anything that's been in the open air 
is basically a cesspool for a bacteria or some kind of amoeba, which your body probably won't like. But when cooking happens, of course, that kills it all and then it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the most simple rule of thumb. With water, it's more tricky. You can't know if any water is safe or not. Like, I guess boiling is an option, but you don't bring your kettle with you while yeah. you travel. So um, then we have to turn to bottled water, which sucks in terms of climate change and pollution, but that can be the only option sometimes. Otherwise, having a really good uh, filtered water bottle, like really good. Mm -hmm. I don't mean some Brita filter. I mean... A serious thing like Life Straw is a company that has one. Um, and then what I do with that water bottle is then I get the filtered water from the hotel that they claim is safe. I don't trust it's safe. So I put my extra filter on top of it. So start with something that at least has the hopes of being safe and then <laughs> assume that it's not safe and apply your due diligence. Yes, Exactly. And then, of course, you've got to keep your water bottle super clean and the straw super clean because that could then get contaminated in your travels. Yeah, I've always thought about that when, you know, when traveling, you know, and I try to be good about using water bottles when I travel. But if I'm picking up a water bottle, I'm kind of thinking, OK, who's touched the lid? How do, how do I clean yep. this lid? Did, did I touch it? Did somebody else touch it? What do I have to clean yeah. it with? Totally. And now with COVID, I feel like everyone's so much more aware of hygiene to like the nth degree yeah. that um, I think people are more able to think of these things, but it can lead to paranoia, which is no good as well, where you're just worried the whole time you're traveling, which your worry can make you get sick because your body is just freaking out through the anxiousness. Yeah. <laughs> so... so as a, we're going to go down this rabbit hole. Uh, so as a, as a, as a side on, you know, making sure food is, is piping hot when you eat it, are there issues of not knowing what you're eating and that causing issues for some people? Yes, of course. So, you know, I wouldn't trust just any old street stall, honestly, like some people swear by street food, but I know someone, a friend of mine who in India ate street food, got E. coli poisoning and later, two weeks later, died. Oh, wow. Um, and obviously that can happen anywhere. But I, when I'm in a place like India where it's truly one of the most um, volatile places I've been for my health and avoiding dysentery, um, is I only eat at really nice restaurants, like, you know, a place that's bustling, where you know the turnover is really high, you know that they're not going to be, you know, using really low quality ingredients and cutting corners with, you know, meat preparation, mm -hmm. for example. Um, India is another whole story with meat, but um, in general, like Mexico, you know, meat is a volatile um you know, food that can quickly get bacteria depending on how it's being handled. So uh, uh, avoid the all-you-can-eat buffets. Absolutely. Um, as tempting as it may be, the likelihood of the disease spread, especially with like utensils being shared and all of that, um, I just wouldn't trust it if I'm traveling in a far-off country. Yep. So so let's let's move let's move away from food poisoning everybody's everybody's favorite topic. <laughs> um, are are there things that we should be thinking about that most people aren't thinking about when they travel? Well, you know, it comes down to the fundamentals of life, you know, food, water, shelter, and safety. And every country, every region of the world has its own mix of those things. Um, so I think the key is doing your research on the country you're going and researching the cultural norms along with what are other travelers' experiences in terms of those four fundamentals of life. Mm -hmm. And I know we, we were talking about this a little bit before we started recording. And I think when we're talking cultural norms, I think there's the importance to understand 
uh, you know, f- from a Western culture, I'm, I'm here in Southern California where, you know, more and more states are approving of the recreational use of, of marijuana. There are definitely countries where any amount of marijuana is illegal and saying that you're an American won't get you out of, out of hot water. Um, are, are there other issues with like uh, LGBTQ? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's one of our big research studies was looking into the different laws and the sentiment towards LGBTQ travelers. And what we found was pretty much unbelievable to us, that there are a handful of countries still in this world that have the death penalty for people that are gay. And if not the death penalty, then 20 years in prison and whippings and all kinds of crazy things. And if you are even showing public display of affection, that can lead to, you know, trouble with the police. And in certain countries like Egypt, the police go on these dating apps and try to lure in tourists to, you know, meet. And then the police will come and potentially arrest you because you wanted to meet up with someone of the same sex. Mm -hmm. Um, And so obviously as a tourist, you may be less susceptible than a local, but it's still an issue and still something it's all about doing your research and knowing what are the cultural norms and what are the laws of that country? Mm -hmm. Like you're saying with drugs, like, Certain places in Indonesia, and I know you mentioned Singapore, it's just unbelievable how you could get imprisoned (laughs) for um, just possessing something that at home you might consider is not a big deal or maybe legal at home. Yeah. Does it also apply to um, like prescription medication where you may have a legal prescription for it? Do we need to be like thinking about – You know, if I have a prescription for this, is this even legal in this country to have a prescription for this medication? I would always check and always bring like documentation from your doctor that you actually were prescribed that thing. So, yeah, it's all about checking up before you go and really doing your due diligence because you never know um, what it's like when you get there. Even when you get to the airport, you might get searched because of something. Yeah, I know I've definitely, uh, flying through, I think, Frankfurt, my wife and I, you know, some random airport security guard, uh, come over here. We want to go through your backpack. I don't have anything with me, but, you know, (laughs) it was kind of that, you know, five minutes of him rifling through my backpack. What's this? What's that? Why do you have this? Why do you have that? Thinking, oh my gosh, do I, I, I didn't think through it. Is my prescription medication legal here? You know? Yeah. Nothing turned out to be an issue. So, you know, thank you much. Have have a nice trip. But it was kind of those, it made me think about, gosh, you know, you know, what, what am I carrying with me? My, my, uh, my dad used to always carry a, like a, a, a foldable little one inch pocket knife on his keychain, And somehow he almost always gets it through TSA but like huh. in some countries that, you know, having a, I suppose, hold, having a folding pocket knife might be an issue. Yeah. Or illegal. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, and we're talking about cultural, cultural norms. Um, what other kind of aspects of cultural norms should we be like aware of? We've talked about, you know, um, uh, public displays of affection may be, may not necessarily be illegal in the country, but maybe. Uh, frowned upon um, mixed race couples uh, yes. in some countries. Yes, for sure. Another big one, especially for female travelers, is dress code in these conservative countries like Muslim countries or even Hindu countries like India. They're very conservative with how the women dress mm-hmm. and showing any excess skin like midriff or especially cleavage or even shoulders is a big no-no and actually can lead to getting into trouble because your um, locals, you know, might be like the local men may be like, um, 
that lady looks like she's available just because of how she's dressing. Mm -hmm. And that brings that unwanted attention. So really knowing the dress code is super important. Um, and I think some women feel like it's a violation to follow the local dress code because they're not used to it. And they think it's wrong that the women are covered up, which may be true in your mind, but you're going to someone else's culture and someone else's country. And I think it's better to respect what the locals are doing and, you know, fit in as a respectful tourist, not some obnoxious foreigner. Yeah. And I know that's particularly true with religious sites, even if it is um, kind of a Western country, a lot of churches are now you need to have your shoulders covered or your legs covered yeah, and, and and I would tend to agree that it's you know you you need to respect the lo local culture. You're not necessarily approving of it by uh, or you know saying that yes, I I agree with this, but you're at least saying hey, this is your country, this is your your religious site. I'm a guest here. Exactly, and that kind of leads me to the question. We, we we talked a little bit about this before. Do we find do you find that you not being uh, an American. Well, I guess technically you are now, but uh, not uh, having grown up in America, do you find that Western travelers are more kind of naive about traveling internationally than other people, than people from other cultures? Yeah, like everyone is naive when they go to a new place, especially if they didn't do their research well enough. Um, so, you know, the same is true if someone from Asia or Africa comes to America then there'll be some naivety for sure. But um, I think generally Westerners can be pretty unprepared, thinking that they are kind of above the laws, even when they're going to another country. And then if we go a step further, then Americans may be one of the cream of the crop of that, where they feel like, because they're American, the rules don't apply to them. Mm -hmm. And that's something I've observed even with me living in America for 18 years. When I'm here, it's like the whole world is America. This country, these collection of states is the world and everything else is a secondary sort of afterthought. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I'm outside of America, like I'm in Europe or somewhere, I'm like, oh, America is just one country out of 192, and that's cool. That's just one of the beautiful mosaic of differences of, in the world culture. Um, and it's just an interesting phenomenon how America has created this collective consciousness of being so centric mm -hmm. and kind of like the center of the world or even the universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and and not necessarily to, to defend Americans. I think, in some sense, because we're such a geographically large country, um, it sometimes we we get confused. Uh, yes. It, also, it's a large population with a a lot of diversity within one country. Like sometimes I talk about America as being a collection of small countries. Yeah, is kind of how it functions more. It's almost like a European Union where you've got these different laws in different states and different customs, even within states and um, even within one city. Yeah. And I think that's a phenomenon that's so interesting around the world is how one city can have so many different accents. And when you're really a local, you're like, I know that guy's from the West side just because of how he speaks. <laughs> the, the base purely off of the slang that's used. Yeah. I know he's a surfer. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think that makes westerners more of a target for scams and like pickpocketing and whatnot well definitely because of the perceived inherent wealth that westerners have when going to a country that's not maybe as um financially abundant and so that's one thing. We're likely to have some expensive equipment like an iPhone or a fancy camera. And we're likely to have pretty good wad of cash in our wallet. Mm -hmm. So for those reasons, it just makes us an easy target. And then 
especially when you're going to, you know, a country in Europe, let's say, where pickpocketing is kind of like their thing. And it's one of the uh, capitals of pickpocketing in the world is in Europe, like Barcelona and Paris and all the big cities, really. Um, then them seeing a naive American tourist just becomes such an easy target because we stand out like a sore thumb, really. So, so how how do we, you know, being an American, it's hard to, you know, hard to look at myself from the outside. How do I stand out as an American when I travel? Well, you know, there's the telltale signs of any traveler is being sort of like confused of where you're going is one thing. Then you're regularly like stopping at all the sites. You're pulling out your map. Um, but the thing that tells specifically an American is often they're very loud. They're obviously speaking English, not French or Spanish or Italian or whatever. Um, and maybe the, the way they're dressed could be um, much more specific to Americans rather than the locals. Um, this is being like very stereotypical, but maybe the weight of the traveler mm -hmm. Um, maybe something that sticks out a little bit. And um, it's also just the mannerisms that, that um, the person is displaying just doesn't look like a local. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of all, all Americans travel with jeans and a T-shirt and, uh, and tennis shoes. Yeah, and maybe a fanny pack. <laughs> yeah. No, no fanny packs. No one's allowed to have fanny packs. <laughs> but like w when we were traveling in... Uh, Turkey, it was the men were almost always wearing khakis, dress shoes, long sleeve dress shirts, uh, a vest, and usually a jacket, even though it was 90 degrees outside. I, I never quite figured that one out, but yeah, it, it, it was it, to me, it was very noticeable. Like, oh, my attire is fundamentally different than everybody else's attire. Some yep. countries, you know, uh, Okay, so so I'm white. I go to Singapore. It's obvious that I'm, I'm probably not a local, but everybody's wearing shorts and a t-shirt and flip flops. So like the attire there out in public isn't so fundamentally different than than some of the places. And I think even if I remember, it, even in Europe, by American standards, people are just dressed up, so to speak, yeah, all the time, exactly. as opposed to you know ripped jeans and things like that. Yep. So, so if we're easily identified, like what are people trying to do to us? I mean, obviously there, there's pickpocketing. Are, are there other kind of scams targeting? Okay, we'll, let, let's stop picking on Westerners, but are there other scams picking uh, targeting tourists? Yeah, I think the number one thing is just getting money. So, you know, pickpocketing is one way, but another way is just scamming with some you know, tourist attraction that may not be a real tourist attraction or overcharging for a taxi ride or the entrance fee to something. Um, pretty much every scam is wanting money. Yeah. And that's a great way to know when to be extra vigilant is around any financial transaction. Mm -hmm. um, and the internet and your phone is your friend in that way to verify and double check things online, even in real time. Obviously, doing it in a discreet way where you're not exposing yourself to your phone being snatched yeah. while you're checking that thing. But um, I think that's probably the biggest thing is just paying too much for something. So it's that sort of thing like if you can buy tickets to something in advance that you buy them in advance online when you know you're not showing up at the front of the, the 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 place kind of looking around all dazed and confused <laughs> yeah and these days there's quite a few um websites where you can buy tickets to practically anything like um get your guide i think is one of them and um yeah it's pretty amazing and usually the deals like the prices are better than even if you did go to the official booth at the destination mm -hmm. but i but i like one of the things that I've always thought of as uh, unusual, and I see it in uh, New York and in Vegas, where there are people selling tickets to a vet to performances well under cost. And I'm always thinking, how do I know you're not 
a, a scammer. Like I, I know what if I'm buying the ticket online, I know what it costs. But I know they also do if they have extra seats. We definitely want to fill them, and sometimes there are ways to get people into hotels and to casinos and stuff. How do you know if there's someone on the street selling tickets, whether they're legitimate or not? I don't think in that case you can know. And I've had that exact thing happen to me many times, even trying to get into the San Diego Zoo. There was a guy trying to sell his tickets for cheap. And I'm just like, no, thank you. I will go to the official entrance and pay the official fees. I don't know who you are. And could well have been a scam. Maybe he wasn't. Maybe he got gifted them and he wanted to get some money or something. But how can you ever know? Yeah. <laughs> that's that's always my thought of like, sure, I always want to pay less for something, but I don't want to get scammed and, and pay for something and not be able to go in. Yes. And if it's too good to be true, it probably is. It's just the most simple thing to think of any scam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's That's one consistent... I mean, I suppose things like, you know, pulling out walls with large amounts of money, c- counting out large bills is always dangerous in public. Absolutely. Things like that. I'm trying to think. So are there any specific tip, tips for, you know, solo travelers versus a family traveling together or women traveling by themselves? Yeah, definitely. So, um, We did this big research study looking into the worst and safest countries for solo female travel. And we looked specifically at the 50 most visited destinations in the world. And the top 10 worst were number one by far. And everyone I've ever spoken to agrees with this. South Africa, Hmm. followed by Brazil, Russia, Mexico, Iran, Dominican Republic, Egypt, Morocco, India, and Thailand are the top 10 worst for solo female travelers. And the biggest thing I think for staying safe in those countries or any country when you're going by yourself is like we keep reiterating is do your research about your destination ahead of time. Um, It's just the most simple thing as a traveler is to really be prepared, know what to expect. Um, having your smartphone, like we've also mentioned, is really your friend these days. And um, when you're in your accommodation, you can have simple things like even a doorstop can add that extra bit of security on your door so that if someone has, you know, the key to your room, there's a little bit bit more of a struggle they have to do to break into that door um as we've also mentioned dressing appropriately for the culture is super important as a solo female traveler and not being too friendly with local men and also never you know trying to be nice like you can be absolutely ruthless as a traveler and i've experienced that myself as a solo male traveler um in india like People really um, can back off quickly if you put up your boundaries strongly and say no loudly. Um, it's a pretty simple thing, but it it really does work. Um, another thing for um, female travel is, you know, um, if you're in feeling like you're in a dangerous situation, you can go and befriend some like local family or something and go near them, go be with some someone you feel is more trustworthy than the people harassing you. Mm-hmm. And of course, there's all the basic things like, you know, don't be distracted while you're walking alone on a street. Don't wear headphones or have your head in a map or your phone. Um, that's a kind of 101 for any traveler. Yeah. But particularly for a solo female traveler, if you're, um, you know, tr- walking down a street alone and obviously at nighttime, then that gets really serious. And I would recommend not even going out at night by yourself. Um, so that's kind of a good overview for solo female travel. But for families, for me, the biggest thing is having good accommodation And that's where we went wrong in 2017 with our Airbnb nightmare, which 
led me down this crazy rabbit hole of researching Airbnb. Um, so what happened there was we arrived in Paris and it was my wife and our 10 month old son. And we loved Airbnb up until that point where, you know, you could have a kitchen and a spare bedroom. It was just like being at a home away from home in beautiful Paris. Um, but when we arrived and went into the property, it was completely moldy. Oh. Like everything was moldy, the windows and the curtains, the walls. And we were left sort of on the street fending for ourselves. Airbnb support wasn't very helpful. We booked a hotel for one night, but we made the mistake of booking an Airbnb after that one night of hotel stay. When we got to that place, the guy was a scammer and he asked for cash and cancelled our booking. And then he, um, he, we called Airbnb and told them what happened. They were like, okay, we can't help you because he's transacting off the platform. Instead, you should stay here. The first place they recommended we stay was hosted by the same scammer who just got us. Oh, no. And then... I just had all the alarm bells going and I realized that something is wrong on this platform and I need to investigate. So long story short, when you're traveling with a family, I recommend staying at a nice hotel because when you've got a baby or even young children, you do not want to be dealing with last minute travel nightmares where you've got to get new accommodation and move all your bags from here to there. We learned that the best way to have a family vacation is go to some nice resort and don't travel around so much. Just enjoy the resort. Just hang out on the beach. <laughs> 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 um, because the other nightmare as a family traveler, especially with the kids, is the car seats. Like we have two kids. If you want to go anywhere safely, you've got to bring your car seats, mm -hmm. put them in a taxi take them out of the taxi, put them somewhere while you go to the restaurant or the amusement park or whatever, and then do the same getting back to your hotel. It's just like a military operation. <laughs> yeah, I, I can totally imagine like the, the concept of like, oh, it'd be so nice to have the kitchen and particularly for a family to have a kitchen so we don't have to eat out every meal. But if it goes awry when you've got little kids in tow, it's not like you can... Yeah, you know, I'm I'm a guy. I can deal with having to find a place at ten o'clock at night. But if you've got screaming, you know, toddlers that who have they're having their meltdown because they wanted to be asleep six hours ago. Yep. I, yeah, that could uh, make a nice vacation turn sour very quickly. Yeah, and then the cost, like with the Paris nightmare, we ended up going to that nice hotel I described with all of that that went wrong, we ended up there anyway, and we had to pay through the nose because it was last minute. Mm -hmm. So what were some of the things that you learned from your, your, your deep dive into Airbnb? Yeah, so we studied originally in 2017, I studied a thousand horror stories of Airbnb guests where something went horribly wrong. And that led to pretty crazy, um, you know, press coverage and a lot of people reaching out to me saying they've had the same thing and this and that. Then a year or two later, I was contacted by a, uh, a few researchers from John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New, New York. And we decided to do a collaboration and go much deeper into it. And this time we analyzed 127,000 Airbnb guest wow. complaints. And we did that via Twitter because many big brands, as I'm sure you're aware, have a customer service handle on Twitter. So you can reach out publicly and say, this is my problem. Can you help me? The great thing about it is it's in the public domain. So we can all go and see what's going on in any major brand's customer service. You just go and see all the latest tweets. And so I noticed that and I realized that you can download every tweet that mentions a certain brand and so we did that and then luckily we got an outside grant because it wasn't cheap mm -hmm. and then we um we used machine learning and natural language processing techniques 
And we had a group of experts who helped us with all of that. It's very technical and quickly gets um, beyond my capabilities. But that allowed us to go from like human reviewed things. We reviewed about 3000 complaints. And then from that, we were able to train the machine learning. And then we categorized all of those tweets. So what we found was, of course, customer service was a huge issue that people were having. And especially because they're going to Twitter means they weren't satisfied from calling customer service or communicating via the app. So they're going to Twitter, try to get some more help, try to make it public. Um, And that was 72% of the complaints. Then we had 22% of them were scams. And these scams range from the biggest one, which is what I've seen over and over again, is the multiple listing scam. And basically what that means is that the same property is listed multiple times at different price points. And it can be just on Airbnb or also on VRBO and other platforms. And they they get it you know, booked at, let's say, $100 a night. But then last minute, someone might be desperate, so they book it at $200 a night. And then the host is able to cancel the person who booked at 100 and now they've got double the revenue. Mm-hmm. And you would think that Airbnb could just, you know, snuff that off their platform. But for whatever reason, they haven't. And it was particularly bad years ago. I think it's gotten a little more tight mm-hmm. with certain um, cities having serious regulations coming in and requiring every listing to have like a, an official license number and different things. But I looked even just a month ago and I was still able to find very easily different um, photos of the same property. Oh. And it's just like absolutely unbelievable. The other thing, of course, that's pretty common is not as described where people show you, you know, these beautiful photos of a swimming pool. But when you get there, there's no water in the swimming pool. (laughs) (laughs) That that makes a difference. (laughs) Or they show you the hot tub. But then when you get there, you need to pay to use the hot tub in addition to your nightly rate. Um, But one thing that was mega alarming is, and this is something that's really um, right on the security line, is accounts getting hacked and then being used so that someone can make bookings through your account and therefore your credit card. And in many cases, I believe that's actually potentially connected to a money laundering scam where the person who is receiving the funds, the host in some other country, at some property they have on Airbnb is connected to the hacker. Mm -hmm. And it's basically just a transfer of funds uh, minus the Airbnb fees. But that's like a beautiful way to launder money. Like it just looks like you stayed in some accommodation and suddenly now there's money somewhere else in the world. Yeah, particularly if it's a inexpensive, exclusive accommodation, it wouldn't necessarily raise red flags to Airbnb because there's no complaint. I mean, nope. obviously, if you're the one who got, you know, your account hacked. Yep, exactly. And then the other thing was unsafe conditions was very eye opening where, you know, there's everything rage, ranging from, you know, bug infestations to mold to and these days. It's a big problem, the uncleanliness and, you know, bodily fluids and things that could be left in a place when you arrive. Um, and then also Airbnbs are used for drug deals and drug use. Um, and even in the most extreme cases, which are pretty rare, but do happen is like rape and bodily assault and all kinds of horrible things like that. And there was a big article, I don't know if you saw in Bloomberg, talking about how Airbnb spends millions of dollars to silence those kinds of horror stories. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, it was quite a eye-opening research. And it's like, 
we could talk about it all day. But if you want to know, after hearing all of that, if you want to know how to avoid Airbnb yes. horror stories, I'm happy to share some tips. <laughs> yes. Now that you've gotten us all thoroughly <laughs> freaked out about ever staying at an Airbnb, assuming we still want to, how do we like go about it in a way that's going to make sure that we're safe? And yes. We're getting and honestly, expect. I have stayed at Airbnb since my nightmares because I had to. It was the only accommodation available in a certain place. Like we had to go to a small town in Colorado and there were these sort of newly renovated, they called them lofts above the town square. And it was, you know, a beautiful place. I found it through Google, like just searching for accommodation in this small town. But when I went to their website, they said, you need to book it through Airbnb. And so that was like the one time I have used an Airbnb mm -hmm. since all of this. And I felt okay because they had a real website, because they had a bunch of these other things I'm about to mention. So my top tips for Airbnb is never book a place with zero reviews. Ideally, look for a minimum 50 reviews, but the more the better. Mm -hmm. And zero reviews, you can be lured in because you're like, oh, it's a new listing. It must be just got up on the platform and Airbnb probably vetted it. But no, never trust something with zero reviews. And along those lines also, only stay at places with a 4.85 star review average or higher. Because, you know, um, it's something I don't know if you're familiar with Airbnb, but it's a two-way review marketplace where the host reviews you as a guest and you review the host and it, their property. And that creates this insane bias where everyone's trying to be nice to everyone yeah. because no one wants to step on any toes and ruin their ratings. So if any property has less than a 4.85, that means something likely went wrong there multiple times. And uh, enough that someone was willing to risk their own reputation to report the yes. issue. Gotcha. Yes. And along those lines as well, I review every review, like read every review carefully and read them as if you're, you know, reading a murder mystery, trying to read between the lines. <laughs> And there's something you can use which does accelerate this process is the search feature where you can search for these sort of keywords like not or but. Mm. The but one is really interesting for me because it's like someone says the place was beautiful, but it was filled with cockroaches and had no AC. <laughs> <laughs> so the but word really helps you identify the things people sort of throw into the flowering review. And um, quickly help you identify things you might not be so excited about with the accommodation that's costing you 200 a night. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, look at the reviews of all the properties that that host may have, because they may, you know, have multiple listings. And in that case, you know, really read the reviews because one of their properties might be getting bad reviews and maybe they've got this special property that has fake reviews that makes it look good. Um, it helps you do a little more due diligence on the host. Mm -hmm. We recommend only using super hosts, which are supposed to be the most trustworthy, least likely to cancel on you kind of host. It's not guaranteed with anything with Airbnb, but they are less likely to be a problem. And then only stay with hosts who have provided verified government ID. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's pretty simple to because early on, and I think in many countries still, all you need is an email and phone number to oh, create nice. an Airbnb hosting account. And so that guy that scammed us in Paris, I documented four different accounts under different names that he created in six weeks. All he has to do is get a new SIM card every time. Which is and he's got a new easy. phone number. Yeah. People don't realize, I think in America also, people don't realize the ease of getting new phone numbers with a SIM card. It's just like $5 for a SIM card. <laughs> it's crazy. So so I'm not super familiar with Airbnb. So a verified government ID will show up in the platform showing that there's an additional level of verification? 
Yeah, it's on their hosting profile. It says verified government ID. You're trusting Airbnb's verification process, which I don't know how rigorous that is. But at least it says, you know, they have verified their ID. I'm guessing it's a driver's license or passport. Um, it doesn't explain to me how a host can get back on the platform so easily. Um, so... I don't know what's going on there. Maybe it's in those countries where they're not requiring the government ID. But that's the most fundamental crazy thing to me is how can you even let anyone host on your platform who doesn't have a verified government ID? Yeah. Like Uber won't let any driver drive without a driver's license. And this is way more serious. We're staying in someone's property. We're sleeping there and potentially risking our life. Yeah. And we're not verifying that that host is even a real person. <laughs> this is why I don't use Airbnb. <laughs> um, and then another one is we like to avoid the professional Airbnb landlords, which has become a real thing. Mm -hmm. Not only is the, the, the ethical issues of them like buying up an entire apartment building, turning it into a, uh, you know, wannabe hotel. Um, but there's also the issue that those people are running it like a mega business and maybe don't really care about one review here or one bad uh, customer experience over there. Mm -hmm. And whereas the early days of Airbnb, it was all about, you know, someone's second home or even a space within their home. And it was much more friendly connecting with a, an individual who loves their home. Mm -hmm. And it's not just some like mass produced business. Um, and then one of the biggest things, of course, is documenting anything that goes wrong with photo and video evidence. Um, and with that being said, only booking with a credit card because your credit card company is your friend, much more so than Airbnb or a host. And if you can prove that you got scammed or you didn't get what you paid for, the credit card company is very likely to um, initiate that chargeback and you get all your money without spending hours on the phone trying to convince Airbnb your case. Yeah. I'm trying to um, – what about places that are like unusually – gosh, this looks really good for the price. Yes, I think it's the same lines um, of that too looks good too to be good. true. It's like, why is it so cheap? Why does it have great reviews and it's so cheap and it's so beautiful? It's just, I don't think so. That there's something <laughs> awry there. Yeah. Yes. It's 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 a ten thousand square foot place with a with a <laughs> luxury pool of view and it's only two hundred and fifty dollars a night. Yep. When it should be thousands a night. <laughs> exactly. So as as we wrap up here, any parting kind of general travel advice? Precautions? Yeah, the thing the thing that I've been saying over and over is the research. And because we have insane ability to research these days with the internet, with the unbelievable documentation of people's experiences in different countries, then I think that's one of the biggest things I reiterate over and over. And finding good blogs from real people, forums, and um, obviously guidebooks still have their place, like Lonely Planet or any of those. Um, also, government websites reading all the travel advisories. Um, I think that's really the biggest thing. But then in terms of safety and health, then, you know, having your wits about you realizing you're not at home and you are a target by default mm -hmm. of being a traveler, you are a target, whether it's, you know, a serious target or just like a mild target or even a friendly target. Yeah. You, you kind of have a target on your head as soon as you step off the plane in a foreign country. And so just having that realization helps you be in the mindset that you need to just sort of think before you act at every turn, yeah. not in a paranoid kind of way, but in a, you know, a well-prepared way. And um, then you can relax and have a 
a journey of a lifetime. And that's what travel's all about is experiencing those new cultures and not worrying about everything that can go wrong, but instead enjoying what will likely go right yeah. as well. And in most cases, most trips, everything will go just fine. Yes, definitely. Or at least almost everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, something will always go wrong, but mostly everything will go right. <laughs> yeah. And that's the other thing I think that's really good with travel is being prepared that if something does go wrong, that you can change your plans. You don't need to be locked in to the thing you planned for the past year. You can actually have more fun if you do something on the spur of a moment. And that's actually some of my most exciting travel experiences were always when I decided to go someplace or do something that I had no plans to do. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the beauty of jumping off and, you know, letting go when you travel is it's just a wide open world out there and there's unlimited experiences and um, things to see that um, you may get off the beaten track, but it's a way better place than when, where all the tourists are. <laughs> yeah, that's that's generally my perspective. I'll, I'll go to some of the touristy locations, but the more interesting things are away from where all the other tourists are. Yep, that's where the real experiences are. So if people want to find you online, social media handles and your website again? Yep, asherferguson.com. And I think I sent all the social handles, but it's Asher and Lyric on Instagram and Facebook and Asher Ferguson on Twitter. And we'll make sure to add all of those to the show notes. Asher, thank you awesome. so much for coming on the podcast today. Thanks, Chris. Have a good one. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Easy Prey Podcast. If you found something in this episode helpful, please let us know by leaving a review at easyprey.com slash review. Notes and a transcript of this episode with Asher Ferguson can be found at easyprey.com slash 99.